Hi, I'm Matt Williams. Welcome to Glimpses. My guest today is a remarkably talented actor, dancer, singer, and songwriter. She is best known for originating the roles of Mimi Marquez in the 1996 premiere of the Broadway musical Rent, and Lucy in the 2000 premiere of the off-Broadway play Jack Goes Boating. She also appeared as Agnes, a bombshell publicist in the series Smash, and as Louisa Lopez in the series Katie King. She also starred in the film adaptation of In the Heights. This performer has been nominated for Tony Awards, Independent Spirit Awards, Outer Critics Circle Awards, Drama Desk Awards, and on and on and on and on and on. It's my great pleasure to welcome Daphne Rubin Vega to Glimpses. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Did I do it okay? Was that a good intro? Yeah. Did I kind of? You know, I, but as a as an artist, I oh. have to say, you missed the you missed the writer part. Like as we age, the dancer part is not is recedes, and the writer producer part. So the legs go and the brain kicks in. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and writer and performer. Well, I want to. Uh, well, producer, like and executive. Produ well, let's producer. talk about that. When did yeah. that come about? How did that come about? It's a post-pandemic uh, phenomenon that happens, you know, when you have streamers and content, right? And um, and um, there's a desire for it um, to just tell stories in in a different way. There's a desire for stories in a different way, and there's a desire to. Uh, <sighs> How should I say appropriate content at a certain time? Yeah. You know, I'm saying that I, yeah. As I've a developed, writer. As a writer, writer, I've developed projects that have gone on to television. So, uh -huh. for example, The Horror of Dolores Roach. Okay. That Angelina. Um, My your, wife. Your beautiful wife. Your incredible <laughs> I agree. wife. She's beautiful. Um, she knows about because she was... Um, you know, she had her eyes and like love on it mm -hmm. um, in its early nascence. And um, it was a project that had to be created mm -hmm. as far as creativity goes. Yeah. Something uh, inside you, you just had to do it. Yeah. Right. And being a member of the labyrinth is um, incredibly. Uh, makes you incredibly lucky and able to be able to put it out there. Well, let's talk about that because your early training, I, I went on, I did a little research. We diverged. Your, your early training, uh, you trained as an actor at the Labyrinth Theater Company, fabulous <laughs> company, and William Esper Studios, right? Yes. So yes. what's the core lesson? What did they teach you basically about performing for acting, writing, directing? What, did, what was the core message or lesson? The core was dare to be foolish. Okay. Dare to show your ass, as it were. Right. Like literally and figuratively and proverbially. Um, dare to tell the truth. Um, but I think that they were different because I, I was kind of um, a disobedient student in the sense that there, I, you know. The training that I had at Esper, um, and that you know, there are a lot of homies that that trained with Esper, right. and it's funny we can look back and laugh at the fact that it was like all your instincts, forget your instincts, okay? Like this is the way you do things, you know. Read a book, listen to Sanford Meisner, and most of all, listen to me, you know. And it was that was my experience of right. it. I have to say that and you was, kind of went your own way with that. Well, I, I, I couldn't help but question that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the word that comes up is disobey, mm -hmm. um, which is a strong word. But um, I didn't mean to disobey. I wanted to be, to do it right. Um, 
It's just that it didn't, it didn't, didn't. It, yeah. And uh, yeah. Let me, you said being truthful and I, I equate that with being vulnerable. And exactly. Exposing your soul, you yeah. know, and that that takes a brave heart to do yes, that. Yes, exactly. And sidebar, I studied that class was with um, Stephen Adley Griergis, who is, you know, both of us were like he, we were like, you know, first scene partners. And Salin Zarillo, who's also like a, a staunch, steadfast, intrepid member of the of the lab, and um. We were all there together and we all had the bad instincts, you know, but it kind of worked out since Stephen won a Pulitzer and you've, you know, been on Broadway and TV. So I think you guys took the right path. <laughs> well, we took the path that we had to take. We didn't have alternatives. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We didn't have um, other paths. It was like, if, if you're going to do this, like let's <sighs> banding together in a space in New York where there were other people that looked and felt like us was the lowest hanging fruit and it was the safest place. It was sanctuary. Sanctuary. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what theater should be. Yeah. Sanctuary. Oh, always a sacred space. Did, uh, yeah. did you always want, how old were you when you had this little bug inside you dancing around going, I think I want to act and sing. Were you one of those kids that sang and danced in front of the TV or did it come yes. later? So this was it. <laughs> yeah, I used to have the pretend tambourine. Everybody's looking at me like, damn, she did. <laughs> the pretend tambourine. I had a pretend tambourine and okay. I would like be with the Jackson Five or, um, you know, the, the five stair steps or, uh, you know, the Partridge family. <laughs> <laughs> and was anyone in your family a performer? Your mom, My your mother dad? played the piano. That my, was... my father played the piano. They, they, you know, we listened to Tom Lehrer and, uh, you know, Reuben Blades, you know, I mean, it, it, we loved music, we loved culture, we loved, you know, jazz, classical. Uh, my father was, you know, a Jewish intellectual. So, you know, he, <laughs> he made a point of saying that, you know, it's not an even playing field. So it made sense. Like, you know, you can audition and educate with these roles, but you're not going to play them. You're not going to play them. You know, I mean, I think that John Leguizamo and, and Liza, just her presence in a room spoke to that. Liza Colon Zayas. Liza Colon Zayas. Who just won an Emmy. Emmy for The Bear. For, for The Best Bear. Best Supporting Actress. Yes. And that was fucking remarkable. Yes. Yes. Because, um, like I said before, and I'll say it again, you know, there are some people who look like us that might win awards that you, you know, you feel like good for them, good for, you know, you know, but this Liza winning for me personally was um, a, the raising of a bar of recognition Yes. of, uh, of, uh, of people. And the thing that I think the people listening should understand. She's mm -hmm. been doing this for 30 years. Oh, no, we didn't roll off a log. And, and get a, she's been doing no. it and working and honing her craft and doing plays and films. She's really worked hard and deserves it. Yeah, and she represents a whole um, legion of us. Right. Uh, she is one, I mean, she's one of one, let's get that clear, but she's one of a legion of of actors who um are awesome and and the fact that she got her props is just a celebration and a win for the labyrinth specifically because uh when you say that she she this is not overnight she's been working at it like we've known each other for 30 years yeah you know i've watched her children grow up you mm -hmm. know she she thought she thanked her grandchildren you know, she's not really that much older than me. She, you know what I mean? It's like we, we've we been doing it for a really hot minute, and it just sort of, um, things start to jigger and make sense. Right. Um, the truth, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Was Rent your first Broadway show? Yeah. Okay. And that was a remarkable piece of theater because it kind of redefined the American musical in some ways, right? Yeah. 
I mean, Rent w- was groundbreaking, mm-hmm. and you were involved from day one, right? Um, <clears throat> people can argue that. I can. I was involved from, you know, there were there were various workshops. There were maybe three or four. I I, I don't know. Um, other people can argue how many workshops right. there were, but I was in the last two. Okay. The workshop before the workshop that became the Broadway show. Okay. So before the, in 90, I came in in 94, I think. Um, and we did a workshop with a different cast. Anthony Rapp was still in it. And, and there were others, um, that, that were, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was kind of like a core group, but there was an iteration workshop in 95 that became the play. Did you know you were making history when you were doing it? Did you have a sense you were or not? Honestly, I think that I was making something um, pivotal. There are a lot of pivotal works that don't like hit history that way. Right. Um, there are many actually, but that one hit and I uh I had no idea it would hit that way. But I, I truly viscerally felt that um that this was speaking to me, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In a way that other things hadn't been, you know, there were plays of plays about queerness and, and AIDS and um you know, off the grid living, um, Lower East Side, you know, people that um, live below 14th Street, you know, for example, but I never saw myself, right? And, um, and yeah, it it was, I saw myself. You found yourself in that role, saw yourself in that role. As as an actor, do you have a dream role uh, throughout all of history, is there? A, do I want to play Lady Macbeth or Jocasta or who? who Not do you anymore. Want to play? I used to. You used I to. used to want to be all of the all of all the ladies right. and all the things. And now I I really can honestly say like that shit doesn't compare to my story. Okay. I mean, and like at first it was about my story and when I grew up and my stuff. But then I see as an older as an elder. Oof, that's what happens when you don't die, you get older. <laughs> and it, it it it's it, it's it's funny and it's painful and it's all the things, but my story is also linked to stories, a diaspora of stories. And that diaspora is um those stories are the stuff of of legend. Right. Right. There's a reason that we ha- do what we do, and the labyrinth specifically. It's like <clears throat> we have a connection to a griot form of storytelling, right? Which is verbal. It's like jazz. It's pre-writing. It's it's like fake news and real news at the same time, right? Because it's it's a relay race. It's perception. Um, and wow, I think uh, I'm grown up enough to know that the difference between perception and propaganda, right? You know, when I grew up, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about being an actor. Fun fact, I went to college. (laughs) I didn't graduate. What did you study? Undergraduate film and television at New York University. Okay. Haig Mnugian was a huge example to um, people like Scorsese and, you know, the Truffaut and uh, uh, Birth of a Fucking Nation was like what we learned as right. as the quintessence of, of, of excellence in filmmaking. And um, I, I couldn't break down. I was, the, I was the only one that had this problem. And if there was anyone that had this disconnect, they weren't talking to me or looking at me. Um, and so... So now you know I I I see the disconnect and I and I can speak to it in a different way mm-hmm. um, that isn't 
that I think other people can recognize, right? And relate to. Do yeah. you have heroes when you were growing up? Was there someone that you looked at on the stage or screen and said, I want to be like so and so? Did you have anyone like that? <laughs> Yeah, but it's crazy. It's like, um, I think of like, you're going to hate me. I mean, I'm going to get like such tomatoes like thrown at me because when I was young. Uh huh. You wanted to be Doris Day. <laughs> I'm teasing. Oh, I wanted to be, wait for it, Gene Hackman or Dustin Hoffman. All right. Those were the careers. And then there was Robert Duvall. I wanted to have that career. I didn't want it to be them, clearly. Right. I didn't. They were leading men that weren't, like, chiseled and stuff. But they they could be beautiful. I mean, Phil Hoffman had that. He, he, he had the, you know, what would Phil do? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Gene Hackman, Dustin Hoffman, and Robert Duvall were roommates together in New York. Stop. I don't think I'm making that up. Really? I, I'm pulling it from my deep memory. I think those three were roommates. I would have, I would have wanted to be like, yeah. see, I would have been like housekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm making a joke. But I mean, I would have been, you know, like fucking in the kitchen but these listening are, to them and being like yeah okay these skills. are gritty versatile in your face actors and that's what you wanted to be in your face they actors. were unapologetic they were committed to right. their choices they didn't mind being uh goofy or funny looking or not the hottest it wasn't about a jawline you right. know it was about they were all character Right. And their characters were badass. Now, because you sing, did you have a favorite <laughs> singer? Was there a singer that you looked at and said, that's who I want to sing like? Was there anyone? Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. Yeah, she... Rufus, right? Yeah. Shaka Khan, I mean, yeah. And then, and then when she, you know, Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Shaka Khan. I mean, I wanted to be Freddie Mercury. You know, I wanted to sing, you know, like... <clears throat> but I'm saying that to say that um, there weren't many uh, women that had the uh, the careers that I could see myself doing. Right. Um, that I I felt comfortable like that that resonates with me. Right. It was like like Mick Jagger had more was was more of a of, of a role model. Well, let's talk about you as a singer because I had no idea until I researched this for the podcast. You began your singing career as the lead singer for the Latin freestyle girl group Pajama Party. This was eighty nine ninety. What what? How did that happen? And what is Latin freestyle? What is that? Yeah, that's a made up term. It okay. was really, it was just, yeah, it was just, it was um, wannabe uh, Latin freestyle. It was pop. I was not the lead singer. I was one of three. Okay. Um, you know, there was, you know, hip hop was happening. Um, and so was, uh, you know, young people getting a beatbox, two turntables and a microphone with a beatbox and, and like a, a, a little keyboard and making music in their house. So, so Latin hip hop is born of that. There okay. were a bunch of bands like from record labels called Micmac, you know, Sweet Sensation, Cynthia, Judy Torres. I mean, you know, Noel, TKA, there are a million of us, cover girls. I mean, I, I you know, I'm sorry if I left y'all out. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, you know, like um, an army of, of people from the boroughs, you know, namely the Boogie Down Bronx mm -hmm. and Brooklyn, who were making music. And so when it got hot, um, people, you know, who went to, you know, Oberlin started to, like, fake it, right? So I was, I, I got plucked from, from a posse that was, um, you know, adjacent, who wanted to make pop music that sounded like this. So we had a song called Yo No Se, Plug the song on Atlantic Records. It was a 12-inch one hit. And um, and there were no... S 
there were no lyrics. No lyrics. In it that were in Spanish other than the chorus, which was yo no sé, which means I don't know. So the whole song is in English, and then the chorus is yo no sé. So, you know, that was an inroad. So now today you get to call us Latin hip hop. So that's kind of how that went down. Now, when you listen to yourself from back then, do you cringe or do yes. you go, I was pretty good? No. You cringe? Yes. Okay. And I was the Latin, the ubiquitous Latin element. I was the street element. Okay. And I mean, people would call us, call me that in my face at that time and laugh and really not think anything of it. So times have changed. Yeah. You were born in Panama City, yes. Panama, right? I was born in Panama City, Panama. And when did you come to New York? How old were you? I was three years old. Three years old. Yes. All right. I came here all by myself. My my mother had broken up with my dad and um and my uncle worked for the embassy. So okay. in Washington DC. So so they put me on a plane and was like that's going to work for you until we settle this. Okay. I'm going to shift gears. You were on Broadway. You're doing eight shows a week. It's a long run. And I don't think people who have never done that realize how grueling that is to do eight shows a week on Broadway. How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep from phoning it in? Because after you have Wednesdays and usually on one of the days on the weekend, you have two shows. How... How do you keep it fresh? Vigilance. Mm -hmm. um, attention. Coming back to the moment. I mean, the spirituality of theater, of acting, is like being in the present moment. And yeah, we have skills so that we can phone it in when we are exhausted. And by skills, do you mean like a technique that you can fall back on? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are skills. Um of like telling the truth or something, uh huh. <laughs> you know, like, um, not what am I saying? What do I mean? Do I mean what I'm saying? Am I just like, you know, thinking about the laundry? Sometimes it doesn't matter that you're thinking about the laundry because nobody knows. Right. Um, and, you know, it's only it's only a problem if you get caught <laughs> with acting. <laughs> right? Isn't that, yeah, don't, it was that Spencer Tracy or someone said, just, you can act all you want, just don't get caught acting. Right? That's right. You're, the resistance. You were talking about the resistance. What, explain that. What is the resistance? Wow. The resistance is, um, <clears throat> well, we know. Well, the resistance is, for me, the, um, the channeling of my creative person, being, essence, into addressing truth to power you know speaking truth to power does not have to be combative it doesn't have to be threatening i think that you know it's very powerful and important at least for myself when i do what i do to know that like uh to be curious you know that's a good thing about the uh the labyrinth in certain spaces that I've been committed to mm -hmm. um, aren't afraid of the dark or the unknown right? or the mystery. It's a true uh, time to shut the fuck up and listen. Listen. And like... Be receptive. And and when you, I want to follow up on this, and when you shut up and listen and you're receptive, what happens? What does that do for you as an actor when you do that? I give myself more space, more grace. Okay. To take chances? Is that the idea? Yes. So you can make, if you're going to make a mistake, make a big one, right? Yeah, I mean, I still, balance. yeah, I mean, that's intellectual. I make the mistake and I'm like, oh my God, I still censor, but I can, I, I see you judge. I see you, um, like judgment. And I see that that's not because I suck, but because I don't, I, I, 
I have to give myself the permission that I've never been given in the world. Um, and that's, you know, always bringing me back to like where we have found our home is a place that has nurtured that. I mean, that that's how it started. Right. I mean, that's what gets you to go somewhere like after school every day, you know, at five o'clock where there's rats in the corner and it's cold in the winter and it's dark. And But it's a haven. It's yes. a sanctuary. Yeah. It's it's sanctuary. And um yeah, and and we go, whoa, like if it's strong and wrong, that's cool too. <laughs> you know, if it's gonna be strong, be strong and wrong. Like, yeah, there's there's nothing wrong with being strong and wrong if you clock it. Right. Right. Um Yeah, if we have measure. Uh what people want to do is subsume you. They look at you, they go female, Latina, black or what, brown, what, and put you in a pigeonhole. And, and what you're talking about, your essence is so much greater than that. Right. You, the essence, your your spiritual essence is greater than that. It's like a super existentialist experience. It's like, I see you seeing me, and that's a different me that I see you seeing, but oh, um, is your truth more real? Like, just to be really aware of that fact and to reflect that in theater right. is a hella powerful thing. And that, is, you know, that is resistance. That brings me back, right? Right. To to talk about that and, like, have fun with it. Humor is so healing. You know, it is so good. You're on stage and you are playing... The, uh, to a house of a thousand or two thousand people, you're filling that space with your energy, right? One thousand or two thousand? I don't know. It's, there you go. You see, there's a difference. But then <laughs> you're on a TV set or a film set, right? And there's a director, the director of photography, and some crew members, and you're playing out a scene. How do you modulate? How do you adjust from playing to a thousand people to playing a scene like this with just? crew members standing around. How do you, how do you make that adjustment? Hmm. Um, well, as you can see, because we're being filmed, like I don't kind of, I forget that where the camera is. Okay. Um, but that's not always true. Like I will remember in, in film, I will remember where the camera is. I'll try to find my light. Um, but I don't. You know, I need to be taken care of in a way. Um, when I when I sing in a microphone, I I don't sound check myself very well. Like I don't know my own needs. Right. It's like I'm just here to to emit what comes out of this vessel. Right. Um, anything that's on the outside in is your job. Right. 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 Although that's not true because we have selfies and we, we have to self tape now and yep. all this stuff. So, um, proportion, uh -huh. um, yeah, it, it's more, it's smaller, I think, um, I'm still figuring it out. Right. Well, you've done pretty well figuring it out. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm still always figuring it out. It's really like when you think you have something, it's like, no, that's really not it. I um, The beautiful thing about theater is that you get to do it again. Yes. And, and, until you don't. Um, and you psych yourself up, for me, into, you know, like Ethan Hawke says, you know, the final performance is the performance uh is 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 the performance everything else is sort of like a rehearsal towards making what isn't david david right as it were um the michelangelo trope so and the final performance in a run is the embodiment of all those lessons that we've learned hopefully mm -hmm. um i love that um and it's kind of how i I roll with it. You always get a chance. Um, with film, it's the opposite. You have to let it go. And so I give lots of different choices, I think, mm -hmm. or I try to, um, so that, yeah, unless I'm told not to. Yeah. Because um, it's not up to me, that final thing. There's a thing that I don't see the end to. Right. Um, there's a certain kind of, and if, and, 
tripping over it. I trip over it, so I have to let it go. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I, I'm going to ask you some personal questions. What is your greatest fear? Uh, um, that something bad will happen to my son. Your children. Yeah, I understand that as a father. Yeah. It's, it's every parent's. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the fear you carry. Was there, and it doesn't seem you've had too many of these, was there a lowest moment in your career where you bottomed out and said, I don't think I want to do this anymore? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and and you know what's funny? It's like I, I sort of stand outside of myself and I see myself going like, ooh, is this that time where you're like, because I've always been like, I don't have a plan B. Like, I really don't have a plan B, right. you know? Um, so... When I had a, I had a record deal um, after Rent, you know, after Rent happened, like, you know, it, it was like about putting out fires, not lighting them, you know, it was in a way, it was like about which, what do I choose? And I wanted music and I had a really, really cushy uh, record deal with a company, uh, Mercury Polygram, that, it, that during the thing got bought up by um universal def jam that's what happened you know business wise right, right um and we just became like you know a, a, like like hundreds of artists um m much more famous than me established were let go so it was like a scramble and you know it was my first like veritable miscarriage it was like i had this baby and it just got Lost and it was like, here's this money. Like, why are you complaining? You got all this money. And um, and I thought, I think I'm gonna become a yoga teacher. <laughs> I really, I really was just like learning Kundalini yoga, like for a good eighteen months. Like I could. How, is that how you? Because every actor, the the, <laughs> the problem with being an actor or a singer, or dancer, but especially an actor, you audition or you go in, they're rejecting you. How do you handle? that rejection besides yoga. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, when I was young, I was like, come on, bring it on. I know. Like, you know, I know, I know that you, you know, um, and none of this is written for me. So I'm going to go for everything that isn't written. And sometimes it was like, Oh, they really do want a blonde with blue eyes and everyone sitting here has blonde. Eyes. Yeah. And, and, and that was shameful. So it was like, maybe don't do that. But like, if it doesn't say blonde with blue eyes, get your fucking ass in there. And, and I really, you know, I, I sang Ju Joni Mitchell for Ozzy Davis. I mean, I did, I was clueless. <laughs> I sang Free Man in Paris for Ozzy Davis. So I was just, you know, um, I made a lot of big mistakes and I kept getting up. After Rent happened, um, I was making the mistakes in front of people, right? Um, I was learning from in front of people. Um, I was being judged. So um, losing that record deal, thinking that I was going to be a songwriter and say, and people wanted to hear what I had to say, right, um, was like a rude awakening. <laughs> okay. Okay. But you have this drive because at this point you could kick back. You've been successful. People would envy your career. You could kick back and kind of go, okay, I've done it. But I sense you still have that drive, that fierce. You still have that that energy that doesn't want to follow the rules. And so, what 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 is that? What keeps driving you? Why why keep doing this? Because this is performance art. This is vocation. This is church, right? Mm -hmm. Like theaters are churches, and. Um, there is no wrong way to worship. You know, I grew up, um, yeah, thinking that there was a distance between me and creator, mm -hmm. you know, higher power, God, whatever, ancestors, all that stuff, um, because I didn't 
obey rules. And, um, and now I know better. I know different. I know that those were never my rules. Right. Um, yeah. And that, uh, it's refreshing to, you know, the truth will piss you off before it sets you free. It's that kind of thing. And like, I'm, I'm getting a little less pissed off about it. It's refreshing. And it's wonderful to, you know, to create that kind of work and, um, and be recognized, not for something, but to have like, you know, if you build it, they will come. Right. Now, do you tap into that power, that thing, the creator, when you're conjuring a character? Does that ever happen? Do you call in the ancestors or spirit or God or goddess or whatever label you want? You know, I have done. I have done. But um, it's anything can become just performative and, you know, right. prescriptive. Um, usually those things happen when you're like, oh, please, you know, like, it's, like, <laughs> it's like desperate. But I have found in graceful moments, like I'm going through it now where uh, I was going to write about this and it's like, it just turned into that. And it's like, wow, it's like a Ouija board. Right. And it's like, okay, that, is that, do we, that is more interesting. That is more, you know, this is not bad. No, no, no hate. Just wait. Uh -huh. This needs to come out and like to listen to the impulse of your inner voice, your artistic voice, and to obey it is, um, it is kind of like, oh shit, that's, that's, that's something talking to me. So pick up a pen, grab the phone, record the melody, the words, the, uh, the knowledge. Uh huh. Right? Right. Like there is there is some channeling going on. I believe that's true. Yeah. I'm almost all creatives. There's some kind of channeling. And I'm not talking religious dogma. I'm just talking about that channeling where you go, I don't know where that came from, but I'm glad it's coming through me. Right? Yes. It really is um cathartic, like literally like like giving birth um sometimes you know it has hurt it's gestated i'm not the one who like decides like oh it's time it's really a formation of nature right. <laughs> and then like if you're sitting at the right time in the right place and it comes it's like oh grab that pen it's usually when i'm in the shower or something um but yeah it's a beautiful thing i love it well, the book's called Glimpses that I wrote, and the I encourage the readers in the book to look for and find little glimpses of God mm -hmm. in their daily life. And by God, I'm not talking about the bearded guy on a cloud or a yes, burning Yes, sky wood. God. What I was talking about was the glimpse. The glimpse. That is the glimpse. And do you see that as you're banging around New York City and going to auditions or performing? Matthew, I do not bang around New York City, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That was my old me. <laughs> um, yes. As you're traveling. As I'm banging around New York City, I do. Yeah. I have God moments, especially with my dog. Yeah? I have a Weimaraner. He's my God dog. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Just, um, yes, my glimpse is that there are times that are not determined by me. Right. But they're like, and I don't surf. I wish I surfed. But the the image of riding the crest of a wave, like a psychic wave, and they come in waves. And it really is very um, native, sacred, native to the land that it's a seasonal thing. And... Um, it reminds me that these are seasons that are within seasons. And sometimes I'm in a season of being receptive to a creative wave. And um, and the more I surf, the more I can kind of will it. Yes. But it really, it's like, oh, surf's up. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, um, I'm using all this jargon that I don't even know about. But it, you don't surf around New York City. <laughs> I, that's what I should have said. Not banging around New York. <laughs> surfing around New York City, yeah. right? <laughs> I do surf. I'm surfing now. Yeah. Um, yeah, in in that I'm doing this work and then, you know, we're talking about this specific thing. It's no coincidence. Um, you know, a girlfriend of mine, you know, she's an actor. She's like hot and working hard so she can't show up for something. So I'll show up for her. And it's like, actually, you know, I'm... I'm being of service and the person that I'm meeting is has got all this knowledge of the shit that I want to know about. Right. So just showing up for them is opening up a world of information. Um, and, you know, when we're on on the beam in on the on the on the board things like that can happen right. more easily than others. Right. I can't catch a train <laughs> or make it here on time. <laughs> but you can serve. <laughs> but I can serve. Well, this is a perfect way to wrap it up. Daphne, thank you. Uh, you are, uh, I feel like I've been sitting with a jazz musician <laughs> yeah. who, because you are remarkable and your career is has been remarkable and will continue to be remarkable because you are immensely talented thank you thank you really you. are i i appreciate that it's good to hear that thank you and thank you for watching this episode of glimpses as you go about your day take the time to look around and catch a glimpse my friends thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of glimpses speaking of glimpses is now available for purchase at your online retailer of choice and the best part Every penny earned will be going to charities who support children in need. You can get your copy in the link below. Until next time, have an amazing day.